on this computer. There we go. Hey, look at that. All right. So today we're doing our last big DBQ review. And all that means is that it's our last day that we're going to spend time actually critiquing DBQs. Um, moving forward, if you have questions on them, if you want to say after school and discuss them on certain tutoring days, things like that, be my guest. Uh, announcements at the top. Every day this week, I will be offering tutoring after school starting around 345, maybe a little sooner. Um, it'll be its own Zoom link. I will post it in the Teams, and all you got to do is come on in. Um, we usually are going to be covering different writing stuff. Today's going to be mainly about format. So if you need help with formatting, and if you need help with breaking stuff down, that's what we're going to do. But if you don't need help with that, and you still need help with something else, come on by. Um, Wednesday, we're going to be looking at really advanced DBQ samples, so we can kind of tell the difference between what is worth six points and what is worth two points, et cetera, right? We're going to do that for LEQs and SAQs as well. Um, Tuesday is going to be a content day and Thursday is going to be a content day where I would like to take input from you guys on what content you want covered in tutoring. But if you guys do not share any, I will just pick some topics that I think we did the weakest on and cover those. Um, now, as far as the rest of this class, because this Paradex only a little bit of it, um, a good chunk of it's going to be this, but the rest of it's going to be review and we're going to basically review unit three. Um, make sure make sure that you are reviewing stuff through Heimler videos. That's the best way I would say on your own or through just looking at your old notes um, because the exam is next week. Both exams are next week, by the way. So your star and your AP test, fourth and six. They moved them up. Um, you guys don't have to worry too much about that star. You guys just keep killing it, doing what you're doing, reviewing, you'll be fine. Only four 11th graders failed the 11th grade star mock. So assuming all y'all that took it at home, took it honestly. Yes. So for both of those tests, guys, I need you to be here, if at all possible. I didn't say you couldn't fail them, but you best not fail them. That would, oh man, especially that star. If y'all fail that star, like, come on now. It's, it'll be easy. Trust me, guys. All right. So I just put the link in the Zoom again for those that are just getting in here. Make sure you click that Paradeck link because we're going to start. Um, when's the start test date, sir? It is the fourth. Yeah, fair enough. Um, yeah, but start test date's Tuesday the fourth. Then Wednesday the fifth is your physics exam, the AP exam. And I know Mr. Castro said he wanted you all here too for that one. And then Thursday's the AP exam for, for US history. So it's three straight days exams. I would say have everybody here if possible. Um, so you can take paper exams. Um, so one thing about the DBQ, let's get into this, right? The DBQ will only be from topic can, when you're done with the AP test, I don't see why not. I believe so. It's like, it's gene stuff. Yeah. As long as you're here to take it. It's free dress. Yeah. And yeah, as long as it's after the test, I don't see why you can't get picked up, but your parents just have to go through the process, you know? Um, okay, so let's let's talk about the DBQ. Um, the dates will all will be from 1754 to 1980, basically meaning that anything from topic three to topic eight is fair game on the DBQ. They will not ask you a question from topic one and two or nine. They will only ask you about stuff from the middle, essentially, right? Um, that's a big window. It's a lot of material, but that's all they'll ask you from. Um, so the DBQ is 25% of your score. Again, they're only going to ask you from periods three to eight. You get 100 minutes for both the DBQ and the LEQ. You should write the DBQ first. And the, the biggest goal is to plan. The secret to success on the DBQ is plan, 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 plan. This is all stuff we already know. It's all stuff we've already talked about. Now, these are the points values, right? Um, wherever you see ATQ, that means answer the question. Um, contextualization, we've been talking about this since last week, right? You need three things that contextualize your prompt. So if your prompt starts in 1800, three things from before 1800 that are relevant to your prompt that can give it proper context, right? Three things. And then your fourth sentence should be all this or, or something along the lines of, and all this will lead to, and then you give me your thesis, right? That first paragraph needs to have your thesis and needs to have your contextualization. That's two points right there. 
you get two more points if you utilize all of the documents and you use them in order to support your thesis. Because if you have a thesis that says one thing, and then when you break down the documents, they're not actually helping your thesis, that doesn't do anything. You won't get any points for that. If you do it with three documents, you get one point. If you do it with six, you get two points. But try to use all six of your documents. Um, you must hip your documents with that uh, four documents. All that means is for four of the documents or more, you need to have like a really detailed breakdown, right? Like the equivalent of a hip. Now, I'm not saying go spend an all, all this time hipping, but you should spend maybe 15, 20 minutes planning for your essays anyways. Um, providing example of outside information that has to be relative to your argument. So if your thesis says something, you use your documents to support it and bring in one more thing that's outside that can support it, if you can. Doing this will be really important and it can be difficult. Like if you reference something that's outside of it but not relevant to your thesis, that doesn't count. And then lastly, the analysis points, uh, making historical connections to modern day or arguing alternate points of view or ways to get it. I like to call it the unicorn point. If you focus on the other six, you're much safer than if you spend too much time going into analysis. So keep that in mind. Again, our goal is to get four, five, or six points on the BBQ, and I think you guys can do it. I really do. And one thing we're going to do here in this Pear Deck, the reason we're in Pear Deck is because we're going to do a couple of peer reviews. We're going to do it with two samples. Um, we're going to look at sample one, and I'm going to give you about three minutes or four minutes to read it, and then I'll give you a minute to tell me the score. How many points did it earn? One through seven, and why? So let's get started. Here is sample one. Again, how many points does this sample earn and why? And I'll give you four minutes to read it. About three and a half minutes. Two and a half minutes. Waiting on a few more responses. How many points do you think this earns? About a minute and change left. I'm waiting on three responses. Two 
one minute left, waiting on two responses. Thirty seconds. Okay, so. Time's up. I'm going to give you about another couple of seconds here just to finish up. I'm waiting on like one or two people. Send me your response in the pair deck again. How many points does this earn? Out of the seven points, how many did it earn? All right, so, so I see a bunch of fives, I see some fours, um, threes, I see somebody with a two. So I rated this a two, and there's a few reasons why it gets a two. The thesis on here is actually really strong. I really liked how simple it is. Um, could it have more? Sure, but it has no contextualization. So that first paragraph gets one point when it could have gotten two. Now, when I read the body paragraphs, the person is not directly referencing the documents. They're saying, document said this. Which document? You know what I'm saying? And that's a big red flag. And they also only do that twice. So they don't even use three documents. They use two without telling you which two. So it doesn't really get any of the document points that it can get. Now, the one other point that I gave it is that I gave it a little bit of outside information. And I did that because they're talking about um, basically like the need for revolution in the way they bring about it. This person very clearly understands the, the material. They just didn't use the right format. They didn't use the documents correctly. Like the Thomas Paine stuff, arguing for independence, like getting that specific, you can maybe do it. But again, that's also kind of from the documents. The problem is they're not referencing the documents and you have to reference the documents. This could have been potentially even one point, but I would say it's probably worth two because of the way that they're using outside info. So, but they're not referencing them all directly. Like they're using author names, which is good. But yeah, like how you're saying, they're indirect. They only mention, they mention the image with the teacups, but they don't say in document one, right? They don't say in document one. And you, they don't say document three, do they? Am I missing this? Oh yeah, document three states, okay. So they mention one document, but they don't directly mention the other ones, unless I'm misreading all of this. Let me double check now. Because yeah, they mentioned the teapots. You're right. But you have to say the teapots is imaged in document one. Like they want it to be direct, right? The, like Thomas Paine, he's referencing, I think it's document four is Thomas Paine. He or she is referencing that. But you have to be direct in telling the, the reader, right? Or the grader, I'm using document four. Here's what Thomas Paine says in document four, right? Here's what the image of the teapot say in document one. Does that make sense, guys? You have to use that terminology in your paper. It takes a little longer, but it's what they need to see. It's not a style thing, it's a format thing. Um, does, that, does that help a little bit, uh, Roman? 
because this is this is good stuff. Like when I read stuff like this and I see little format errors, it it could be worth a little bit more, or a lot of bit more, I should say. Yeah, could have been worth a lot more because they only, you're right, they directly reference three. I missed that initially, but they do not directly, they, they reference documents, but without saying it. And you can't do that. In fact, if they don't say in document three, the way they did in the beginning with all of them, that doesn't work, right? You, you have to accredit, you have to like, it's almost like citing a source. You have to give credit to the document without just referencing it indirectly in that sense. Um, but good stuff, guys. Um, pretty much everybody was on the right track. Um, so again, 1.2 points is around where it should be, but it could have been way more easily. Like it would have been three points if they had said document three, document one, document four. Right? It would have been that. It could have been even more if they had included a contextualization. So let's look at this next one. Now this next one, the writing part doesn't work because I did something wrong. I don't know what it is, but it doesn't actually write. So what I want you to do is I'm going to give you about five minutes um, to read this one. And when you're done reading it, please put done in the chat box on Zoom if you can. I know some people can't go between back and forth. But when you are done, please put done in the chat box and then I'll give you a prompt to, uh, to answer the score. about four minutes. Again, when you're done, if you can, please put done in the chat. So I know we're done reading and I can change the slide to a righty one so we can write into it. And if you do finish, please be uh, patient while you are looking through. Start thinking about what your response will be so that way we can be on the next slide for only a little bit of time. Okay. Two minutes. OK, 
And again, those of you that are done, start thinking of your score. What is it going to be? So that way on the next slide, you can share it. One minute. All right, so let me put in a slide for writing. I'll give you another minute and a half. What was the score for sample two? What do you got? Remember, I need to see from everybody. Make sure you respond about 40 seconds on the clock. Okay. All right. So, oof, some low, some right in the good spot. So, the average I see the consensus here seems to be about five points. Um, there's I got some fours. I got a couple of twos. Um, but five points is the average. And when we go back to it, that's what I gave it. Um, part of why I gave this five points is. There's a thesis there in the beginning, the whole first paragraph is like, right, like a thesis. Um, it's a little, what would be the term, like like jumbled, like it, if the person cleaned it up a little better, it, it would come off better, but it's there, you can find it. And then their second paragraph is their contextualization. Um, their contextualization solid. I would really have liked to have seen it in the first paragraph with the thesis. I think that would have helped make the thesis more streamlined. And I think it would have helped the essay overall. So that's two points. They reference all six of their documents. They all seven actually. 
right? One, two, seven, four, three, five, six. Yeah, they reference all seven. So that's two points there because every time they use the document, they're using it to support their thesis. Now that's four points. They get their fifth point, not from contextualization or not from outside info, I'm sorry, but because they do a really good job of breaking down the documents that they have, right? So that's five points. The reason they do not get the outside information point is because they reference um, slavery with the Spanish colonization and the French colonization. They reference things like really French relationship with the natives and stuff like that stuff does not happen in 63 and it has no relevance to American independence, right? And because of that, um, they're taking the American independence movement of the 63 and bringing it back a hundred years. Does that make sense? It's not that they're not, I saw the tie they're trying to make, right? They're trying to point out, hey, like stuff's still wrong in the British colonies, you know, they only care about money and expansion. They don't care about the natives, right? Like I get that. I get what you're trying to connect it to person who wrote this. Um, I don't know why I'm speaking like they're in here, but the person, they're going a little too far back with their outside info. Um, something they could have done with outside info is maybe talk specifically about um, maybe like the American slave trade or something to that effect. But the plantation system, right? Maybe something like that could have helped their argument because I get where they're going, but they don't get there. They're talking about stuff that happened too long ago and saying that it happened during the independence wars. It's just not true. Um, so that's where that goes. And because of the little flow errors and because of that big one, they cannot get the analysis for it either, which five points is right in the middle. If you get five points on your A-Push DBQ, that's where you want to be. So this is a really good response. Are there any questions on DBQs right now while we are here? Because we are going to move from this to something else. Give it a few seconds and either in the chat or on, on oh, we can't write in this paragraph. Either on the chat or on that. Okay. Okay. So that is closed. All right. So we're going to get into unit three specifically. We're going to talk about slavery. We're going to talk about the American Revolution. We're going to talk about some of the colonial grievances. We're going to talk about all that good stuff. So right now, all I need is for everybody to be in the chat box. You do not need to be anywhere else other than chat. That's where I should see your names popping up. Again, participation is key here. If I ask a question, answer it to the best of your ability. If you don't know it, I'll tell you, hey, just put I don't know. It's not the end of the world. So first thing about slavery, um, before I even go to the slide, who started slavery in North America? What nation? Who is the first nation? Yep, Spain. Um, who did Spain use for slaves initially? Or what group of people did Spain use for slaves? Like, did they bring already existing slaves? They use the natives, right? Now, does anybody remember that pesky rude problem the natives kept having? What did those rude natives keep doing? They kept dying, right? Inconsiderate natives kept dying or they kept escaping. So not a function, not a functioning group. It's hard to get slave labor with natives. So where did the Spanish go? They get these from the Portuguese. What do they do with the Portuguese? They start getting who or what? No, it's who. African slaves. Yep, that's right. That's right. They start bringing in African slaves from the Portuguese, the Spanish bringing slavery to the United States and North America as a result, right? Because it's already a North American thing. Now, the, it gets into the United States specifically through Virginia and the tobacco plantations. But let's talk about the end of the Atlantic slave trade. So that Atlantic slave trade that the Spanish participated in, that the early residents at Jamestown participated in, that goes away in 1808. The Constitution makes it illegal, and the U.S. also backs out. Once all the countries back out, triangular trade is kind of dead. And the Atlantic slave trade middle passage is done as well. It doesn't happen anymore. 
So if slavery in the U.S. is done, well, not slavery, if the Atlantic slave trade is dead in the U.S. by 1810, where are all the new slaves coming from? Because there's still going to be new slaves. Slavery is still going to be on the rise. Where are all the slaves in the United States coming from post-1810? Take a guess. If you don't know, take a guess or put, I have no idea. Where are all the slaves coming from? They're not coming from Africa anymore. Where are they coming from? There is no longer an African slave trade. If you don't know, it's okay, because we covered this a long time ago. But just tell me, like, hey, I don't know. Okay. Okay. You're on the right track. Yeah. So, so it's not the West Indies because the West Indies is where the, is that's Atlantic trade in the Atlantic triangle trade. That's where the slaves come from. So it's not the West Indies, but those of you that said the South, cause I saw two of you in there. You're not wrong, right? You're not, you're, you're like, you're like 70% of the way there. So after the slaves in the United States are now American born. So from 1810, let's say all the way till the end of slavery, every slave in the United States was born and bred in the United States. Does that make sense? They're not so much African slaves as much as they are American slaves, which is even worse to think about it that way. And this is mostly happening in the South. So yes, they come from the South, right? But they're coming from the United States. They were born in the United States, born into slavery. That's a way you could explain it a little bit, right? So that's where slaves came from post triangle trade being over. It's just an important concept to keep in mind. I'm gonna skip the chart ring to get right into this. So uh, free enterprise, somebody remind me, what's free enterprise? What's a free enterprise system? Somebody wanna remind me? The shades, right, sweet shades. What is it, what do we got? What about somebody who hasn't responded yet? I've got most of you guys responding, but a couple of people haven't responded since Pear Day. What do you guys got? What's free enterprise? And again, if you don't know, just put, eh, you know, I don't know. Yes. So free enterprise is where the government does not get involved in the economic endeavors of the nation, right? They stay off, hands off. Now, the colonists are able to enjoy free enterprise for most of their existence as a colony. Right? They're able to smuggle, do whatever they want, buy whatever they want, sell whatever they want. Government is not involved though in free enterprise. But the government gets involved. Why do they get involved? What do the British, why are the British all of a sudden enforcing old laws like the Navigation Acts, enforcing smuggling and making it punishable, taking people's ships, charging taxes on the colonies, because of the Seven Years' War, right? The British are in a major war debt. And so they start, yep, war debt. So they start not being free enterprise, right? They start being hands-on. They start getting involved in the economy. They start dictating what the colonies can and can't do. This, this is known as the end of a period called salutary neglect. Salutary neglect is the when colonists were able to do whatever they wanted, that free enterprise period. That's salutary neglect. That's the British not enforcing rules they already had. But when they get into a massive war debt from the Seven Years' War, they begin to enforce the laws that they had already did. These aren't new laws. Some of the taxes are, but they're enforcing old laws. They're just actually enforcing them now. Salutary neglect is over. It was, why? Yeah, Seven Years' War. Oh, were you thinking French and Indian War? My brain, my brain. It's all good. This stuff, guys, there's a lot of this info here. It's not a, oh, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, it's a seven years war. That's the war. But honestly, like, no, yeah, it's, try to remember seven years. Um, if you don't remember seven years war, guys, you can use French and Indian war. Seven years war is just the more proper terminology for it. But when you're, if you're struggling to remember it, use French and Indian war. They'll know what you're talking about. You know what I mean? Like, if that makes sense. So if that's easier to remember, do that. Um, but yeah, seven years of war led to war debt leads to the end of that stuff, right? So all of these acts, you don't need to write any of this down. These are all slides that are already in Google Classroom. It's nothing new. It's the unit three review exam. You see it right here. But why are the colonists so angry at these taxes? 
what are these tax acts, the Townsend, Stamp, Sugar, Tea, what do they all do to the colonists to make them upset? Why are the colonists mad at these? Because, well, that's what I'm asking. Why are the colonists mad at these? What do you think? Because there's one thing that it's not. Right, they're not mad at the money. In fact, some of these made money, say, made prices lower. Like the Sugar Act makes molasses cheaper for people. The Tea Act, I believe, makes the tea cheaper as well. But why are the colonists so upset? Yes, because there is no representation for the colonies in Parliament. They believe these taxes are unfair on the grounds that they are not being represented in Parliament. Parliament's making these acts without their consent. And consent of the governed is key, according to the Enlightenment, right? So again, it's not about the money. It's not the money. In fact, some of these things make money, make it less money. They make products cheaper. It's the fact that they're being taxed without representation that is upsetting the colonies so much. So let's lead into some protests, right? Some acting out, some violent acts, you could say, that the colonies did. Um, Boston Massacre, they're not all violent. I shouldn't say that. Um, group of colonists were gathering around Customs House. They were harassing, throwing snowballs and rocks at soldiers. Um, one of the soldiers fired their gun. A few others were fired as well. And five colonists were laid dead, including Chris Addicts, a mixed race sailor who was present at the, you know, frustration stuff. Another major one that was in 1770, by the way. When you talk about um, colonies acting out, the 1770s is the first big one. Um, Boston Tea Party, it's a way to protest tea on tax. Uh, during the Boston Tea Party, the Sons of Liberty, led by Sam Adams, dumped a million dollars worth of British tea into the harbor. These will lead directly to the coercive or intolerable acts, which we'll talk about in a second. Again, the Boston Tea Party is a direct um, attack on the Tea Act, and it will lead to a direct policy attack, so to speak, on the Massachusetts colony. Sons of Liberty, just really quick, secret club really cool dudes that are all interested in liberty and advancing the rights of the colonists. Um, some historians, uh, modern historians will say that you kind of got to give Abigail Adams credit because she's, you know, wherever John Adams is, Abigail is. Um, but so she's in there on that picture, but um, the, the notable members are Sam and John Adams, Patrick Henry and John Hancock. Um, there will be a Daughters of Liberty and they will do things like brew different homemade like American style teas instead of buying British tea, they will help sewing uh, uniforms, things like that, making bullets. They will do a lot of things as well, serving as nurses, I believe, in the, in the war later on. So, coercive acts, four laws. Boston Port Act closes the harbor. Massachusetts Government Act limits town meetings and controls the government of the colony. Um, Administration of Justice Act means that any English official like a soldier has to be sent back to England to face trial where they were often released. Um, and then the Quartering Act, which is where soldiers are able to force themselves into your home and stay there. Um, these are really dangerous to the colonies. Um, in fact, when these are passed, they only affect Massachusetts directly, but almost all, 12 of the 13 colonies will meet at the Continental Congress and discuss these acts. Why do these acts scare the other colonies so much? It doesn't affect them. This act, the Boston Port Act, does not affect South Carolina does not affect Virginia, but why are they at this meeting with Massachusetts? And again, if you're not sure, you don't know, just tell me, I don't know, I'm not sure. But why do you think they're at this meeting with Massachusetts? Give you about 20 seconds, what do you got? A couple of not sures. Ooh, that's some good one. So, if you're enforcing more, so basically, you're you're on the right track. Um, if Britain can do this to Massachusetts, right, they can do it to every other colony. And because of that fear, all the colonists say, "Hold up, let's talk about this." Right? 
that's where the meaning comes from. If British can do it to Massachusetts, they can do it to any of the other colonies. I believe the only colony that doesn't go is Georgia, but eh, what are you gonna do? Um, Common Sense, pamphlet written by Thomas Paine. This pamphlet was designed to convince the hearts and minds of regular folks, regular people, get them involved and get them on the side of the uh, revolution. Um, and he was very successful at that because, again, he spoke to common people. That was his goal. Um, in 75, fighting will officially start with the shot heard around the world. Uh, Lexington conquered. Soldiers will meet uh, Minutemen there, British soldiers, and they will be defeated and chased all the way back to Boston, essentially. The colonials will do that. Um, in 76, Declaration of Independence is made. Independence is declared. Um, it includes a list of grievances. It is mainly written by Thomas Jefferson, uh, and it is inspired greatly by Enlightenment ideals. We're almost done. I know we're running out of time. Um, tail of the tape really quick. British have all the money, all the gear, all the training, loyalists supporting them in the colonies and the best Navy in the world. The Patriots have home field advantage in the territory. They don't have to worry about supply line maintainment and they have the will to win, which is hard to quantify, but they have the will to win. Um, we're just gonna go over some key battles, Bunker Hill. British suffer major casualties, but still take the field and win the battle despite losing thousands or hundreds at the very least. Battle of Trenton, 76, um, in December of that year. Um, after a string of defeats suffered by Washington and the Continental Army being chased out of and around New York, Washington will lead them to sneak up on some Hessian mercenaries and capture and defeat them in one of the best early victories in the revolution. It restores morale in the Patriot cause. It keeps the army from splitting up and quitting. It's very powerful. Our next big turning point is Saratoga in 77, when the Americans get a victory and prove to the French, hey, we can win this, and then the French join the fight to support the Americans. Another major crucial point, uh, Valley at Winter Forge, harsh, harsh winners. This proves Washington as a leader, mainly because it allows for the army to stay together and stay moral, moralized and all this stuff, even though it's rough. And Baron von Steuben will show up there to help train and improve the army, make them a little bit better, leading us to eventually the Battle of Yorktown in 1781 when the British surrender to an American and French attack. Um, a couple of important fighters, guys you already know, right? Lafayette, Baron von Steuben, John Paul Jones, we need to get into them. Um, peace treaty that ended the war was the Treaty of Paris in 1783. Officially ends the revolution and makes the United States its own territory. Um, revolutionary ideas in America. All that means is it leads to common people being in Congress, expansion of voting rights, and increases in religious freedom, which wasn't allowed before. Now we're going to get into all the stuff about government a little later. So now we're going to talk about your exit ticket. It's a very straightforward, easy exit ticket. All you got to do is read the three prompts. These are three DBQ prompts. I do not want you to answer these prompts. I want you to read the three prompts, and I want you to explain what they mean in your own words. It's like, what is this prompt asking you to write about? Tell me that underneath it. What is the prompt asking you to write about? That's it. That's all I want you to do. Don't fill anything else out. Don't answer anymore. What are these prompts asking you to write about? And once you're done with that, you are done with today, guys. That is it. Have a great rest of your 